you will hear a man asking for information about language classes over the phone. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4, Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, Globetrotters Language School. How may I help you? Yes, I was wondering if you could give me some information on language classes. Certainly. What language are you interested in studying? Well, that's the thing. I'm interested in learning Japanese, but I'd also like to improve my Chinese. I don't know which to study right now. Maybe the class schedule will help you decide. Did you want to study in the morning, afternoon or evening? I work in the evenings, so mornings or afternoons would be best. Then that decides it for you. We offer an advanced Chinese class, but it meets on Wednesday and Friday evenings. I couldn't do that. When do the Japanese classes meet? We have beginning Japanese on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. No, wait, that's intermediate Japanese. Which level do you want? Advanced? Uh, no, beginning, definitely. I know some Chinese and some French, but I'm a real beginner with Japanese. Well then, are you free Monday, Wednesday and Friday mornings? That's when the beginning Japanese classes meet. We also have intermediate French on Friday mornings. I could do those mornings, but I'd prefer afternoon. Don't you have anything in the afternoon? We have intermediate Japanese class on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. I really need a beginner class, so I'll take the morning Japanese class. Could you give me an idea of the cost? What would be the tuition for the Japanese class? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10 Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. The beginning level classes meet three times a week, so they cost a bit more than the other levels. For a six-week course, the cost would be $575. That's a bit steep. If it's hard for you to pay that much, you could sign up for just four weeks of class and pay $410. Or you could pay for one week at a time at $125 a week. That comes out to be much more expensive once you add up all the weeks. That's true. You can save money by registering for two levels together. For example, pay for your beginning and intermediate classes now and you'll get 12 weeks of class for just $1,050. That's not a bad deal, but I can't come up with that much money at once. I'll just pay for the six-week course. Fine. That class begins next week, so you need to register right away. Can't I register over the phone? No, I'm sorry. We don't take phone registrations. What you'll need to do is visit the school office today or tomorrow. Bring a cheque for the tuition and a photo ID. Is that all? Yes. We'll give you a registration form to complete, or you can save time by visiting our website and downloading the form there. Complete it and bring it into the office with your cheque. Great. I'll stop by this afternoon. Fine. When you arrive, ask for Mr Lindsay. He's in charge of student registration. I'm sorry, Mr. Who? Mr. Lindsay, spelled L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Thank you for your help. Thank you. We we'll look forward to seeing you in class. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an Arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly... I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think.
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a potential student at Clevedon College and a representative in the Information Centre. Presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good morning, Clevedon College. Can I help you? Yes, please. I'd like some information about evening courses this term. Okay. Which subjects are you interested in? Two subjects, actually: languages and computer skills. Okay. What languages are you interested in? Actually, I'm not sure. I have to fulfil a language requirement for school. But I haven't really decided what language to study.、Mm, how many language courses do you run each week? We have two every night, from Monday to Friday. I'm sorry, but would you mind going through the schedule for me?、Mm, which language on which days? Not at all. Monday to Wednesday are modern European languages: French, Spanish, German, Dutch, and Polish. Thursday night we offer ancient languages, Latin and ancient Greek, and on Friday we finish off with the Asian languages of Hindi and Bengali. Monday to Wednesday, modern European. Thursday, ancient languages, and Friday, Asian. Can you spell Bengali, please? Yes, it's B E N. G A L I. Great. And how much do the courses cost? Each course costs twenty-five pound per person per term. But if you want to do two language courses, there's a ten percent discount. But only if you book for two terms. So the ten percent discount is if I take two courses for two terms. Is that right? Right. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Would it be possible for me to book my classes right now? No, sorry, the computer's down. What I suggest you do is call extension nine six nine four. Oh no, sorry, six nine nine four after six p.m. and ask for Mrs. Johnson. I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Did you say six nine nine four after six p.m.? Yes, six nine nine four. Please ask for Mrs. Johnson. Thanks. Okay. Can we now look at the computer skill courses? Yes, of course. Computer classes always start in the first week of the month, and the way it works is we offer one computer class for the entire month. So you might spend one month on databases, another month on Excel, and so on. Classes meet once a week on Tuesday afternoons. 
The next class starts February 1st. OK, a y so for the upcoming month, February? February is going to be databases. There are 24 places still free on that course and it costs £40 per person. February databases, 24 openings, £40. OK. a y Excel starts in March and that's nearly full. Only four slots left. It's £45. OK, a y Excel. March. Only four slots left. Got it. April is Outlook. That is never as popular since it costs so much more. But you get a free CD. It is £60 for the month and there are 19 places left. OK, a y April. Outlook. £60. Is that it? No. On the 3rd of June, we start a word course. We have 16 vacancies for that at the moment. It's also expensive at £55. 3rd of June, word, 16 vacancies, £55. Now, do I call the same number to book a place in one of these classes? No, you have to call Mary Jones, I think. Yes, Mary Jones, extension 9623. Sorry, could you repeat that number? Yes, extension 9623. Please call her before 6pm. OK, a y many thanks for all your help. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, 
If smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee Project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the later... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.